When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce with Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Welcome, everybody, to season eight of Insatiable. This season's theme is consistency. It's no secret that consistency is the key to success. Many of us have so much health knowledge and are aware of the latest and greatest food research and have the best of intentions, and then real life happens. We fall off track, lose motivation, and get discouraged. Convention tells us consistency is about willpower, discipline, and hard work. But research and adult development theory points elsewhere. 15 years ago, I discovered functional medicine and reversed my irritable bowel syndrome, depression, and a host of issues. I was amazed at the power of food as medicine and felt amazing. But even with all these great results, I couldn't keep it up. I continued to binge and overeat. My quest to discover why can't I stick with this led me to grad school to study adult development and how we change ingrained patterns and behaviors. I came to realize inconsistency is a symptom, just like depression and binging. It's not the problem, but has various root causes depending on the individual. Not only is falling off track an invitation into deeper healing and radical results, I found that when it comes to consistency, A lot of the common beliefs we have around being consistent are what actually causes us to fall off track. In this insatiable season, we will look at inconsistency as a symptom, not a problem. We'll explore what happens after the novelty of some new plan has worn off and why real life trips us up. What are the various root causes of why we lose motivation, want to be, quote, bad with our food and tell ourselves, chuck it, F it. (laughs) Today, we're going to talk about how overeating and binging often happen when we don't feel satisfied from just one piece of cake, feel heartbreakingly alone, and are empty of the meaning in our jobs. All of these feelings are tributaries back to one root cause, a sense of disconnection from ourselves. In today's episode, we have the wonderful Toko Pa Turner <laughs> to discuss with us how we can map how a lack of connection with ourselves is why we are inconsistent with our eating and self-care goals. We're gonna discover what belonging is, the deepest form of connection, as a skill set we can all learn, and how working with our dreams and rewriting our stories allows us to offer our gifts to the world, which is integral to belonging. I am so grateful to have Toko Pa here with us to discuss belonging. I read her book, Belonging, Remembering Ourselves Home last year, And it felt like such a deeper understanding for me of what it means to belong. I can always tell when someone knows what they're talking about by the clarity and beauty with which they write. And her book has both. And I also realized we were doing similar work, but very different modalities. Me with work that blends nutrition and adult development theory and her with dream work. But the journey back home to ourselves is the medicine we both offer. Before we get to hear from Toko Pa, I want to give you her background. She is a writer, teacher, and dream worker. She is the author of the award-winning book, Belonging, Remembering Ourselves Home, which won the 2017 Nautilus Gold Award, the 2018 Reader's Favorite Gold Award, and was named finalist for the 2018 Whistler Independent Book Award. She founded the Dream School in 2001, which blends the mystical tradition of Sufism in which she was raised with, and she integrates a Jungian approach to her dream work. She has been interviewed by CNN News and BBC Radio and has a community of over 100,000 online readers. Toko Pa's work focuses on restoring the feminine, reconciling paradox, my favorite, (laughs) and facilitating sacred grief in ritual practice. Thank you so much for being here, Toko Pa. I am so happy to be here with you, Ali. Thanks for having me. 
Yeah. And you're good friends with uh, our previous sensational guest, Bethany Webster, who was a huge hit. Yeah. So, you know, yeah, Bethany, Bethany, Bethany and me are BFFs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I was like, I have to have you on. <laughs> and this was the perfect uh, season to have you on. So I want to start with your story and how you came to understanding belonging through being a literal orphan. Can you share that with us? Yeah. So um, I grew up in a household that you know, as you said in my bio, I was raised as a Sufi. And so there were years in my life where I really enjoyed living in community. But at a certain point, I think I was about eight years old, and my mother became pregnant with my little sister. And at that time, we left community living and went to go and live in the suburbs. And for me, that was a very dramatic change for me because suddenly I was isolated in now this very nuclear family context as well as living in the suburbs. I sort of grew up in the red light district of Montreal. So it was a very dramatic cultural change as well. And in these isolated circumstances, it became very clear to me as a small person that my household was volatile and there was a lot of violence and different kinds of abuse and neglect. And I began to feel very exiled and unbelonging in my own family. And so at a very young age, I started to imagine leaving the family home and I started to run away or at least practice at running away when I was nine years old. And I wasn't very good at it, obviously, because I wasn't old enough to, to take care of myself. But then I was, I guess you could say, successful at running away at the, by the time I turned 14, going on 15. So that was when I you know, was placed into what we call the system. So the foster system or, you know, just government care, so-called caretaking facilities where people who don't have parents are sent. And that began, you know, that whole period of my life was characterized by a lot of darkness and a lot of hardship. And that was the, the last time that I ended up having a family. So my, change, my life changed dramatically after that. And do you think moving to the suburbs created some of the issues with your family or did you not recognize the degree of that because you had that other sense of community to still attach to? Yeah, I mean, I do think it's both because when I lived in community, we would have, we had 18 with this rundown tenement and I had like nine cats and 18 different families that lived there. So I was constantly interacting with different people. And we also had all of these community practices like Zikir, you know, singing and chanting and devotion, singing and dancing. And we would eat communally. And there were lots of cats to play with. And, and <laughs> And stuff like that. So, so there, there was a lot of different influences in my life. And then suddenly, when we went into these, these isolated circumstances in the suburbs, yeah, I think it put a lot of pressure on everyone. But I also think that the pathologies that were already there now came to the surface, really to be seen. Um, so it was, I guess, it was one of those things where it was easier to for it to blend into all the other activities. But suddenly, I was completely alone with this with this set of parents who had a lot of problems and some of those may have been exacerbated by they themselves being socially isolated yeah it's amazing we you know i know you're in canada but i think you guys have some of the similar myths a lot on this podcast we talk about how we filter everything through the individual and i think your story shows how so much environment and, and belonging, right, uh, influences what parts of our personalities can come out or not. It's kind of like what soil are we in versus what's the seed. Absolutely. And I think in a lot of uh, psychological and mental health professions that this is something that is being grossly neglected in our consideration when we're talking about mental illness, because, you know, not only must we consider the environment in which we are being raised, but 
also, I think we, we have to look at that larger piece, which is the intergenerational momentum or lack of momentum that has led to our lives. So it's a it belonging is a complex issue that has many different faces, but I think these are the three main levels. We have to look at what's happening at the level of the personal, but then we have to look at the cultural piece and, and what we're being taught by the culture that we live in. And then there is this intergenerational or ancestral piece where we often see dramatic displacement of people from their place of origin. Yeah, that reminds me, I saw this community of therapists who are like kind of coming together and saying, you know, should we change the manual for rather than the DSM, you know, diagnostic manual, rather than saying the individual has depression to the individuals growing up in a trauma induced society. <laughs> and I just yeah. love that reframe of like, wait a second, this is a symptom of intergenerational trauma, you know, cultural or intergenerational displacement and trauma, and then the cultural, and then it kind of that the individual is a microcosm of that. And of course we have some free will, but we rely heavily on the free will, I think, and not enough on these other pieces that you mentioned. Absolutely. And I, I, and I think that reframe is so important because otherwise the individual feels as if they have something wrong with them. They think, well, I have this pathology. Well, you know, there's a reason why we have the issues that we have and that You know, we have to look at those roots if we have any hope of not only healing ourselves personally and sharing some of the burden of responsibility around that with the the culture that we grew up in. Yeah. So, and I think what your book does so beautifully is show these three layers, both in concrete and clear terms, but also in these beautiful metaphors. And so can you talk a little bit about how we might not be literal orphans, but how you came to understand that we orphan parts of ourselves for false belonging. Well, so I when I'm when I'm thinking about belonging, I'm always holding these two pieces right beside each other. You know, belonging and exile. That they're like uh, dark sisters <laughs> of each other. You know, counterparts of the same thing. And so, in the way that I look at belonging, I really believe that belonging is actually dynamic. You know, we think of belonging as something as, you know, that if we look for it and we search really diligently, that maybe one day we'll find it. And, and when we find it, we'll, we'll feel belonging as a constant state of bliss forever and ever. And this has a very static kind of definition, like either you belong or you don't. But I believe dynamic, I believe that belonging is actually dynamic and it, it actually requires periods of exile, of being outcast, of being isolated, of being alone or orphaned. What I like to always do is turn towards classical fairy tales and try to understand the archetypal patterns which present themselves in fairy tales and understand how then those same patterns of behavior apply to our own lives. So what I mean by that is you can find many fairy tales and stories in which there is often an orphan who is ultimately going to be the hero or heroine of that story. So something like the little match girl or even in modern terms, Harry Potter and so many different stories like that, Someone like Cinderella, you know, where someone in some way has been separated from their parents. They are alone in the world. And in that aloneness, they realize that they have some kind of mission. They have a task, which is ahead of them and they have to go through a series of trials and tribulations in order to develop a character, develop the character which makes them the hero or heroine of the story. And I don't believe that we are that much different, that actually, even if we do have parents in the world, a lot of people like myself, I had parents who were and are alive in the world, but I felt such estrangement and rejection 
from my family home that it was, in a sense, very much like being an orphan. And eventually, as I told you with my story, I left my family home and, and quite literally became an orphan with parents still alive in the world. But there are some people who still remain in contact with their parents, but perhaps they were taught when they were raised that there were certain qualities that they possessed which should be celebrated and revered and aggrandized, while other qualities were devalued and diminished and ridiculed, or even worse yet, completely neglected and unseen. So what happens in this dynamic when we're taught that there are certain things about us that should be celebrated and that are good, while other qualities are bad and we should keep hidden, there is something that develops in the psyche which understands that if we want to maintain our sense of belonging in our family home or in our relationship or in our workplace or whatever the scenario may be, that we have to disconnect or split ourselves off from those devalued qualities. But when you have enough practice with this over time, eventually you become alienated from those qualities yourself. You may forget about them or even have a rejection or repulsion of those qualities in your own personality, in your conscious personality. So this creates a, a split in the psyche, and you can truly never feel a sense of belonging so long as there is that split at the core of the self. Can I want to read a passage from the book that you, just so people get a sense of how beautifully written it is, that explains what what you just described. You write, our first experience of unbelonging is like a pattern in our substrate, which like rocks in the soil, causes everything to grow awkwardly around it. Tracing our longing back to its origins, reconciling it to its history, and is an important step to healing belonging forward. You then say, the demands of your environment forced you to put your gifts out of sight while you attended to something more immediate. And that as kids, you mentioned that we're so adaptable that that's when this substrate or this beginning of rejecting that, or I guess orphaning it, (laughs) or sending it to exile, I don't don't want to use the wrong words, begins, right? And so it's almost like as we become adults, we don't even know it's missing. That's right. That's exact. And that's when we have that sort of nebulous grief where it's like, I'm longing for something, but I don't even know what that is. And that's a very hard place to be because you can't even really articulate what it is that is, is causing this ache. And so, yeah, so when we split, uh, I call these the refugee aspects of the self because those parts of ourselves don't, don't cease to exist. They just go and live in the margins of acceptability in our lives. And so I'm sure as, I'm, as we're talking about this, you can feel how there's always this, this symmetry between what is happening at the level of self and what is happening at the level of culture. And so I'm always kind of wanting to make this bridge between those two things. Because don't we have that same racism and xenophobia which exists at the cultural level? Well, I, I truly believe that this starts at the self. This starts at the conditioning that we experience to place ourselves off from un, so-called unbecoming qualities. And that's how othering starts. That is the seed that begins this a huge cultural problem that we have where we believe, you know, others are the terrorists. Others are weird and uncomfortable. Others are uh, strange and different. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think for, for listeners, we had this longing and what how sometimes the symptoms of these longings are I'm not thin enough, right? I'm not healthy enough. I don't have enough time. I don't have enough money. And that, it's this longing for these parts of ourselves come out as, and, and Tokopa, I love that you, you really um, explicitly said this in your book, scarcity is an inner condition, right? And part of racism and xenophobia is believing that those other people are taking our resources, right? Where that's not the case at all. And so can you 
explain how this not enoughness <laughs> is a mirror for the projection of our own lack of wholeness. Because I think sometimes it's where I am in my personal j- development journey, I get it, right? <laughs> but the me of maybe 15 years ago might be like, how does this not enoughness <laughs> show up as a lack of accepting all the parts of myself or the refugee, the exiled parts? So you make this wonderful point and and yes, scarcity is an inner condition, but I just want to make sure that we're being careful here because scarcity is also an outer condition. Oh, yeah. You know, it is. Yeah, I, I just, you know, sometimes there are a lot of schools of thought that say, you know, whatever you believe to be true will create your own reality. And I am not one of those people, <laughs> but I do believe that there is this profound connection between the two and and it's it's like there's a conversation always taking place between the inner and the outer so when we're talking about scarcity and not enoughness i think we have to ask ourselves really at the root you know it's not about not having enough money that would be the concretized version of scarcity but Looking at its emotional roots, scarcity has to do with a lack of affection. It has to do with a lack of love, the absence of tenderness. You know, I talk a lot about mothering in my book because, you know, the relationship that we have with our mothers is the first place where we learn nurturing or not. And so in my case, I I tell this story in my book about how my brother was born two years before me. So when I came into the world, he was kind of ruling the roost of our family. And so I came along and my mother would tell me this story about how she tried to breastfeed me, but whenever she tried to breastfeed me, and I don't know if this is true or not, because, you know, I was just an infant, but that my brother would have a tantrum. And when he had a tantrum, she said she would have to put me down to go and tend to my brother. And she said in a, in a few weeks, the milk dried up. And so I was never breastfed. So I use this as a story as an example of the absence of physical nurturing at that incredibly formative age, which of course also had many emotional implications in in my particular story as well, the absence of mothering. But this kind of lays the groundwork for how we feel about the world in general. So if we start off with too much scarcity, then we expect a lack of scarcity in the world. And this is a wound that has to be rehabilitated over time. And so in my book, I talk about the importance of learning to receive, actually, because I think when you don't have enough nurturing, instead you have to be self-sufficient. And a lot of us learn to be so self-sufficient that we actually atrophy the ability to receive support from others, from ourselves, from the earth, and so on. Oh, that is so beautifully said. And I'm so glad that you brought up the differentiation between inner scarcity and, and external scarcity because I'm the same as you. I'm not in those abundant mindset. It's all what you think. And I think for people listening, it's kind of like the equivalent. They say that once you make you know $70,000, money doesn't buy you happiness, but you need that base of security. So I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Toko Pa, yeah, this is, not, this is more if you feel like it's never enough, right? Or where you feel a lot of my clients feel like I have so much to be grateful for, but it just, it doesn't feel enough. Right. <laughs> and so, th- so that's, that's just a bit of a, a different thing because that's more like around perfectionism, right? Like mm-hmm. that, what, what you're doing or what you're creating is not enough for some unknown standard for some, you know, litmus that we don't see. And I think that has a lot to do with the it also, what we talked about with regards to really, truly being able to receive nurturing and support and um, love, but it also has to do with that we were talking about earlier, the manic culture in which we live, which is 
constantly proposing this idea of a no upper limit to what is enough for us to be accepted, that we're constantly driven to achieve more. And we never talk about satiety, uh, you know, being satiated. We never talk about enoughness. What does enoughness feel like? Yeah, I loved in your book that you're like, it's not really the kind of, forget how you said it, like not the starting point and not where we are, but the scale of what we're trying to, you know, satiate ourselves on because that scale has no upper limit, which leads to quite, and I even think of the meta, like the physical scale people, you know, it's like always 10 more pounds or mm. it's never enough. And it's such a, I thought of that as the concrete representation of that, but your metaphor of <laughs> the scale and this upper limitness that seems to have no, no limits. Mm-hmm, exactly. And I love that you're bringing the body into it because we, so many of us have this, especially those of us who have chronic illness and, and disease, there's, there's this, this pressure to get to some sort of wellness plateau, which constantly feels out of reach. Meanwhile, missing the incredible tiny triumphs, which are moving the needle in day-to-day living, you know, and that really being able to give thanks to the progress we are making, to the strides we are taking, even just getting up and getting on the mat or, you know, having that smoothie for breakfast or whatever it is that is supportive of your health and well-being is like to really allow ourselves to be celebrated and and to to feel the nurturing from a nurturing standpoint instead of a sort of crack the whip standpoint. Yeah. And I loved in your book how you said that, you know, belonging has become, Dr. Brene Brown has made it very popular. I feel like it's becoming more in your book, obviously adding to the conversation. And yet I feel like you have um, a very holistic definition. And in your book, you talk about how the body is left out of all of these conversations, which is mm-hmm. deafening, right? The silence is deafening. And, you know, our, our season's theme is consistency. And you just talked about people with chronic illness. You have rheumatoid arthritis, correct? Yes, that's right. Although a lot of people who have my disease prefer the language rheumatoid disease only because, you know, there's so many different kinds, there's like a thousand different kinds of arthritis. And often people hear the word rheumatoid arthritis and they think, oh yeah, my granny had that. But it's completely different from osteoarthritis and it's actually an autoimmune disease, which is uh, degenerative and attacks all of not only the joints, but the organs in the body. So, So yeah, we're slowly trying to change the name of the disease, but it's, you know, an uphill battle. (laughs) Well, well, thank you for letting us know, because that's really important. So rheumatoid disease. And one of the things you, you know, you talk about in your book is that the Western medical model detaches us from our pain. And we try to control all of this through medication. And I think, you know, our, our season's theme is consistency. And I think one of the main reasons people struggle with doing those consistent things that move the needle that feel like they're not this all, big all or nothing, but we don't understand our pain, right? Whether it's cravings or physical pain or shame that we feel from not being enough, we tend to judge our body rather than explore it. And so I was just wondering what your experience has been in living with the rheumatoid disease and the connection for you between this illness and staying true to belonging in your body, even when it's hard? Mm -hmm. I mean, (laughs) it's, let me just say that I have a friend who, she has this great expression. She she read my book. She was one of the first people to read my book. She was one of my beta readers. And she says, you know what I love about this book? And she says it with a great Irish accent. (laughs) What I love about this book is nobody gets saved. (laughs) <laughs> and and um and I laughed so hard because it's so true. You know, this isn't thirty days to belonging. It's not. It's <laughs> not. Um, take this checklist and you'll, you know, I don't know, unleash your potential or whatever it is. It's not like that. It's about. 
it is about this consistency. You know, I really believe that belonging is a practice, not a place or a state of attainment. It is actually a practice. And so this work of uh, belonging in our bodies is just a practice that you can continue to deepen. And so for me, the turning point into this awareness was a moment where I tell a story in my book about waking up from a dream about my pain and the dream context made me realize that I was carrying something in my pain that actually was intergenerational and that it was the privilege of actually having the support of my beloved partner and my work and my community and my home. It was those privileges which have allowed me to actually address this pain with my life. And that was a turning point for me because for the first time, was able to feel a small measure of compassion towards my pain. So up until then, and I still fall prey to it, you know, annoyance, anger, irritation. I just want to, I want to like kind of an aggressive feeling towards my pain, like, oh, you're making life hard for me, or, geez, this hurts so much, or when are you going to stop torturing me? (laughs) These are the kinds of things that I, I thought for a long, long time. And then when I realized there was a context to my pain, not just from my own life, which had led me to this point, but for the intergenerational trauma that came from my people's people into the momentum of my life, through the momentum into my life. And from that awareness, I could feel some compassion, like, oh, it's like a cry. And of course, that would seem very obvious if I had a child or an animal or something that was neglected or wounded. And of course, I would naturally feel that compassion for their pain. But somehow in our own bodies, we're just, the pain is more immediate. So we forget to have compassion for the pain that's being experienced. And so this is my practice, is trying to be respectful of my pain as I go about the many protocols that I undertake to to become more well, to become healthy. Yeah, I love that. And I have this big note of like, to let everyone know, wholeness doesn't mean perfect health, right? We, to your point, this assumption that there's this finish line that if we do belonging correctly and follow the steps, <laughs> right, our, our pain is going to come to this natural heroic end, right? It's mm-hmm. like, you know, and, and, I, and I thought it was so interesting how you talk about we, because in the work I do with clients, we really are breaking down binary thinking. It's people don't just think their food choices are good or bad. They have that binary thinking around those parts of themselves that they've exiled as well. And so a lot of the work is to break down this binary thinking. And I had never thought about how we even put wellness and sickness as, as if they're at two ends of the opposite spectrum when I mean, how do you really define that? Like you can be, feel great one day and then come down with a headache. Are you sick Mm. or are you well, right? Or Mm. to your point, you can be in pain and yet it can bring support. It can help you receive. It can help you bring compassion for yourself, Mm. which are all to me metrics of health. (laughs) Uh, Mm. And I thought that was such a good point. And, you know, you said in your book, and I, I, I teared up when I read this, you said about our pain, it's important to say this too is welcome this too belongs. Yeah, that's my mantra. This too belongs. This too, this, even this terrible thing. I have to practice that welcoming welcoming it into belonging 
because otherwise it's living on those terrible neglected margins of acceptability in my own heart. And this is the work, you know, and and yes, you know, I, I wrote this book, I spoke about my rheumatoid disease. And then after the book came out, I uh, began to get invited to speak and make appearances. And so I would and I, you know, I would go and do these events. Invariably, there would be a person in the audience who says, you know, I read about your book and I, I read your book and I, I saw how sick you were and you went through such a hard time. But look, you're standing here and you did it and you know how can I do that too and I would have to use these as quite strong teaching moments and say just because I'm standing here doesn't mean that I'm well in the way that you understand the word well you know I continue to have this disease and I will for the rest of my life and me and my family are doing our best to live in relationship with it. So we, I call my, we call my, my husband and I call my disease our house guest who never leaves because, you know, it's like this really, uh, really awful, sometimes traumatic presence who's constantly putting us through the ringer as we try to find a way to deal with each new obstacles and challenge. And yet, you know, he's not moving out anytime soon. So we need to get right with it. We need to make room in our lives for it. And we've gotten so much better over the years and, and we'll continue I think, to be compassionately inclusive of that difficulty. Oh, I love that. So we're going to take a break, a short break to hear from our sponsor. But when we come back, we're going to talk about the other things that belong that we can, so that we can start to welcome back and bring to ourselves. So we'll be back after this short message from our sponsor. It's that time of year again. The live version of my annual group program, Why Am I Eating This Now?, opens for registration August 5th and begins August 13th. This program will help you unlock your keys to consistency with your nutrition goals. And with a small group of 15 people, we will get to the root causes of why you fall off track. Together, we'll transform those patterns and behaviors, no willpower required. To learn more, check out Episode 6, Season 5, where Why Am I Eating This Now? participants, Dr. Tina Bugrin and Lourdes Brawley discuss how using adult development theory, which is not therapy or coaching, made the program so challenging, life-changing, and different from anything they've done before. A year later, they're still seeing results, impact, and feeling further transformed. Here's what they shared. Dr. Bugrin said, Why Am I Eating This Now? is about getting to the root of things not hovering on the surface as too many other programs plans do. As a result, I stopped slipping with my healthy eating and falling into old thought patterns. I got unstuck and have the tools to keep going. One year out of the why am I eating this now process and using the tools, I've lost 20 pounds and kept them off. Lourdes shared, I joined why am I eating this now because I wanted to move forward in my own self-development. I was able to discover the deeper conflict around my food battle, including how it protects me and how to move forward. I exceeded my own expectations for my progress, was challenged, and will continue to make these changes in my life. I have been binge-free for over a year post why I'm eating this now. I truly thought I'd never break free from emotional eating, but I have, and I am much bolder in my life. Yes, win-win. If you're ready to work smarter, not harder, to be consistent and reach your nutrition and wellness goals, join us. Full details are at alishapiro.com. Why Am I Eating This Now live program. And make sure you sign up on my list so that you can get the early bird discount. And if you don't want to wait, you can get started today with the self-study program now. What you pay for this will be credited towards the cost of the live program. So why not get started today and start getting relief and clarity? So Tokopa, before we took our quick break, we were talking about re-welcoming our pain and, and being compassionate with it. One of the other big messages of your book is that we must rewelcome anger, disappointment, and grief. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I think, you know, I kind of joke with clients when we're working and they're like, this is hard. I'm like, wah, wah, wah. Like, I wish I could tell you it was the five steps or it was, you know, super, <laughs> easy, super easy. So we always joke like, wah, wah, wah. And I think if people hear anger, disappointment, and grief, it's like, oh, that's a lot, <laughs> right? 
But can you expand upon that? And, and before you do, I just want to, for people listening, I want to show you an example of how this shows up with inconsistency. I had a client who I hadn't seen in, in several years, and she had a really rough year. She had a grandson who was going through, through cancer, right? Very young. And she was eating relatively well because of the, all the work we had done together. But she came back because she was finding herself grabbing chocolate. And she knew it wasn't about the food. So we explored it. And really, she was grabbing chocolate when she was over at her family's house. And she, her family was there in the beginning. And she continued to ask for what she needed. But because treatments were so long, you know, the, the support fell apart, fell, fell away. And what she realized was when she was over there, she was feeling extreme disappointment, right? They had let her down, even though she was clear about what she wanted. Mm. And she was like, you know, it's okay. Our nuclear, my daughter and, you know, my husband, we're all closer now. And I was like, and that's great. And you can be disappointed that people didn't show up the way that you would have liked. And so this is often, we think that, you know, we can't, when we deny anger, disappointment, and grief, we end up eating in those situations where we feel like we can't bring that side of ourselves to the table. So I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about those three feelings that are definitely exiled culturally and usually internally. Yes. I wrote a chapter in the book called The Dark Guest. And it's actually, in, the title of the chapter is inspired by a Rumi poem called The Guest House. And he says, this being human is a guest house. Every morning, a new arrival, a joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness comes as an unexpected visitor. Welcome and entertain them all, he says. Even if they're a crowd of sorrows who violently sweep your house empty of its furniture, still treat each guest honorably. He may be clearing you out for some new delight. The dark thought, the shame, the malice, meet them at the door laughing and invite them in. Be grateful for whoever comes because each has been sent as a guide from beyond. So this is one of my, my favorite poems by Rumi, translated by Coleman Barks. And so what I wanted to do with this rather robust chapter, I think it's one of the thickest chapter in the book, chapters in the book, because I wanted to cover a lot of the popular dark guests. <laughs> and so, yes, grief. And what were the three that you want to know about? Disappointment and anger, and, yeah? Yes, yes. Yeah. So we start with anger. So what I try to do is, you know, if I am making a true encounter with each of these emotions, which each of, with each of these guests, can I attempt to be curious, to be at least curious of them so that I can find out maybe what it is that they want to say instead of just trying to push them away or trying to override them and be something else or trying to drown them out with positive thoughts or whatever it is, because none of those things are really sustainable. As anybody who's had tried to just have positive thoughts, it knows it doesn't work, not, not long term. And what might happen is it'll, those so-called dark or negative emotions will express themselves in other ways, uh, whether that is, you know, lashing out inappropriately or uh, having an unexpected crying fit or actually symptomology in our bodies. So anger, for instance, you know, women especially, but men as well, are taught that anger is a negative emotion and you shouldn't have it. You shouldn't express it. And it makes you less likable. And it's not the feminine thing to do. It's not ladylike. <laughs> so these are particularly for women, the kinds of programming that we get. But for men, it's a bit different. It's, it's a little more, anger is a little more sanctioned for men, where it's like, that's an acceptable form of expression for men is to, yeah, 
you know, kick his ass, that kind of thing, or whatever, whatever the form They're a is. leader. They're an aggressive yeah, leader. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So I want to get curious about anger. And, and when I do, I discover that anger arises when my boundaries have been transgressed in some way, or mm. when something that I care about is being threatened or devalued. If that's the case, then I have to sort of examine. I want to listen to my anger. I actually want to, uh, first of all, I don't advocate for just like letting loose on people. <laughs> I don't think that's the way forward, <laughs> tempting as it may be. I think the better thing is actually to sit in contemplation or move in contemplation, whatever works for you, and really run your emotions, like really let them even amplify them and let them really come on strong and find out what it is that you're mad about. What is it that's causing your anger? And I guarantee you're going to find something where something was transgressed, whether it was your own boundary or maybe you don't feel heard or maybe you've ignored your own needs for so long and not spoken about them that other people don't even know that you have needs. Whatever it is, or, or maybe it has to do with some something or someone that you care about. For instance, I I'll get really angry about what's happening to the environment and what's happening to people of color and these things create rage in me. So we kind of have to look for what the root is. And at that point, once we have contacted what's actually making us angry, now we can make a decision about how to take that anger and move in defense of whatever has been transgressed in a productive way in our lives. Often this looks like asserting your boundaries again and again. And in the story that you told about the woman who, whose, self, her, whose care just got uh, just fell away. Here, she had stated a boundary. And so, uh, though she was feeling disappointment, there's probably some anger in there too. Like, okay, well, you need to restate that boundary and again and again until it's really clear for everyone. And that's the only way that you can really honor your anger. So, you see, the anger is there for a reason and it's telling us something. And it's not others that have to validate that anger. It's us. We need to validate that anger first and foremost in the self, at the level of the self first. And then when we have that inner stability from that validation, then we can move into the world and say, hey, I'm really angry about this and this can't happen again. Or this is not acceptable to me and you need to know that. And then if people continue to uh, disrespect the boundaries that you have, then something else has to be done, you know? So we, we can make an informed decision based on on only our true recognition of what is triggering that anger in the first place. And maybe I'll just add one little side note here that if you are someone who has been deeply traumatized and if you have PTSD, anger is often a chronic symptom of having been being traumatized. If that is the case, you're in a bit of a different situation. I'm not saying that you can't work with the same principles, but it's a little more kind of like people report from people who have been traumatized report having anger many, many times a day. And so it's good to have definitely have support in terms of a therapeutic environment, but probably also some adjunct practices, especially somatic ones which can help us to, to feel safe in our bodies and while having anger. Yeah, that was so excellent. And, you know, to kind of circle back and what you were saying about what's happening with people of color and how we other ourselves, one of the notes I wanted to make and, and talk to you a little bit about is because the majority of, our, of my listeners are white women. And we know how frustrating it is that we can't express anger. And yet women of color... <laughs> are given even less less leeway. And this was after the 2016 election. I basically got real comfortable with my anger for three years straight. <laughs> it's not over, but it's now being channeled effectively. Yeah. But one of the things that was just so shocking to me because I 
is learning how how racist our society is. And you know, I have friends of all all races and and all this stuff. And I never thought that I had internalized that angry black woman character that our culture, because again, mainly white people haven't <laughs> learned to deal with their anger. And so we put it onto other people as a as an identity, not necessarily as individuals, but as an identity. And you know, of course, I didn't feel that way about my friends who were were black. In fact, they were less angry than me. This was kind of like a big wake up call for me. And they were like, <laughs> you know, and the more that I learned, the more I didn't understand how people of color in general, not just not just black people, not just Latinos, natives, how they haven't, how they're not more angry, right? Like, cause I, the more that I learned, the more enraged I've become. And so I just want people, especially our white listeners to question your own biases, right? We live in a racist society. We tend to shy away from racism because we think it means that We don't like people of color that we're wearing KKK hats. No, the best we can hope to be is anti-racist. And part of that is looking at our own biases and reaction when people of color get angry, right? What biases have you internalized? And I was shocked that I had internalized that with women I didn't know, not with my friends, but people I didn't know. And I just want to share that so that other people can hopefully feel less shame about examining their own biases. In that. I'm so I'm so glad you gave some airtime to those thoughts. I just think it's so essential now that especially white women who have platforms are again and again returning to these conversations about racism because how else are other white women going to start talking about it because it doesn't affect us in a day-to-day way unless we are, you know, getting hot under the collar about it with each other. And um, I think there's a really intricate piece here that I want to pull out, which is that the reason why we reject women of color and black women, especially when they get angry, is because Um, is at least in part because we ourselves have not integrated our own abilities to be angry. And so the reaction is to, you know, put somebody under the boot and say, quiet down, you know, I don't want to hear from you. Well, that's just a very strong mirror of what kind of havingness we have around our own spectrum of expressions as well. So it's really important important work to be doing the both the inner work and the outer work of racial justice. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for, for making that line much clearer because I, I don't think I said that as like sometimes people hear white people and it's like, and you know, it, it, a wall goes up. I'm, I'm learning how to talk about this in a way that, you know, I've been reading doing anti-racist work and reading for like three years now, which obviously I'm just at the beginning, but I think I've become so, I don't clam up at hearing whiteness as, a, as part of my identity, even, you know, even though I'm half Jewish, I obviously benefit from whiteness, but I've even learned that being Jewish is not a white identity. It's like how little I knew. So it's, it's a constant learning curve that I'm clearly at the beginning of, but thank you for, for articulating that. And, and I think that brings home the point in the beginning, that as we bring these parts back of ourselves, of our anger, of our grief, of our disappointment, we can be with other people who are experiencing mm-hmm. that and we can mm-hmm. be more productive rather than mm-hmm. just overwhelmed in our feelings, which took me, I mean, I was taking action right away, but it took me about a good three years to learn how to not be angry all the time. It was, I wasn't scared. I just didn't know what to do. <laughs> I was like, mm. I didn't, cause I didn't feel like I was doing enough, but yeah. So one of the big things that kind of switching gears, cause I want to really get into this dream work and I know we've got a, we've, we're coming, we've got about 15 minutes left, but one of the things that I think is just so amazing. I mean, there's so much that I love about your book, but it's dream work and how dreaming can start to help us be okay with these parts of ourselves. I was just working with a client and just, I've always said this on the podcast, but just if you're a new listening, anytime I use a client example, I've gotten their permission. I just want to restate that. But I was working with a client and she was saying how, you know, she kept having this reoccurring dream where she was at this party and no one would listen to her, right? Kind of asserting her boundaries and no one would listen to her. And then gradually she realized that, it was her who wasn't listening to her, right? Yeah. 
And I was like, oh my God, I'm interviewing Toko Pa Turner, who has this great book on belonging. And she says that, you know, we cast ourselves in our dreams so we can actually have some compassion towards ourselves. And it was so insightful of her, you know? So I just wanted you to talk about how dream work can help us reclaim these refuge or these um, exiled parts of ourselves. Obviously, not the whole, I mean, we don't have the time for all of it, but <laughs> I'm going to stop talking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, you know, that's the problem with talking about belonging is that it's just such a massive subject. That's how I ended up spending five years of my life writing a book about it because, <laughs> and, and I also just want to name that I've only scratched the surface of this conversation. But the way that I understand dreaming is that dreaming is actually nature, naturing through us. So in the same way that a, a, a tree bears fruit or a plant gives flowers, dreams are produced through us. And I literally believe that there is a, a larger intelligence, which I call nature, which has an, it's an organizing principle and um, which is guiding our lives in the direction of not only our personal sense of alignment, but also in harmony with that larger ecosystem, which we are just a part of. So this is what I think dreaming really is. And so I use dreams throughout the book and reference how to work with dreams throughout the book, because I think this is an incredibly powerful tool as we're learning to dismantle the othering that happens at the level of the psyche and the trauma that so many of us are unpacking about our lives and the needs of our combined coherence. All of this takes forms in the dream. And this is the brilliant thing because instead of it being, you know, having, um, we'll go back to the example of anger, instead of just having a nebulous kind of anger, you can receive a dream which shows you exactly the context in which anger is coming up. And by exactly, I mean symbolically. <laughs> and that's the <laughs> tricky part, is learning to understand the language of the dreams. And you know, so many indigenous cultures around the world have used dreams as a central guiding principle in village life, in cultural life. It's really only us who has this poverty of not paying attention to our dreams in the West. And this whole idea that you need a you need to pay somebody who went to a university to tell you what your dreams mean. I mean, it's just a bunch of nonsense. I mean, this is our mother tongue. And um, unfortunately, we have lost the ability to understand these dreams. But it doesn't take that much to re-facilitate our abilities with this language. But the first thing you have to do really is to write them down and to give them some relevance or importance in your life. And so I do teach online and I help people to understand the language of their dreams. But for me, the, the most incredible thing is our dreams will show us exactly where we are at in the mythic unfolding of our lives. And so what I mean by that is, you know, earlier I was talking about fairy tales and, and about how, you know, a set of chapters unfold in every myth or fairy tale. When we understand these patterns, working with fairy tales and working with dreams, it helps us understand why we are experiencing what we're experiencing in present time because we can see where we've come from, but it also invites us to consider what is the way forward? So I love the example that you used of the woman at a party who wasn't listening, who she was talking to somebody and nobody was listening to she her. She was talking to a bunch of so, people. 
a bunch of people. Talking to, <laughs> talking to a bunch of people and nobody's listening to you. I mean, we all have dreams like that, right? <laughs> it's the sense of not being relevant, of not being heard. And so, so yes, so the dream offers this really strong mirror of, well, if all of the aspects in my dream are aspects of myself, all the people in my dream, the characters are actually aspects of myself, then where am I not listening to myself? Where am I not feeling relevant? What is it that I really want to be heard with? And how can I listen to that? How can I bring more presence to that? And so when we do that work at the level of the personal, again, there's this symmetry which then carries out into the world. And we are more courageous with our ability to be seen, with our willingness to be seen and to be heard. And one of the important things that I, I think is that you bring up in your book, and I'll, I'll use an example of my own life, but you talk about like, you can't go to a dream book and like, on this podcast, we always talk about not one size fits all, whether it's eating or whatever, but you can't go to a dream book and expect one person's symbols to being your symbols because they mean what they mean to you because of your lived experience. And second of all, to your point about the unfolding chapters, I think sometimes we try to make conclusion from one dream versus realizing that there's going to be more data coming, more information coming. And I think about back in 2012, I was working with a visual imagery therapist. I feel like my psyche was finally strong enough to go back to around when I was diagnosed with cancer. And even though I, I was working with him in his office, I would have these dreams where I was going to the hospital and I didn't know if I was checking in for chemo, if I was really sick, did they have my medical records? And I remember thinking, like, if this were the old me, I'd assume that I was going to get sick again. Like, oh, this is what this means. Like, because I would wake up with the same uncertainty that I felt after I was diagnosed with cancer. And I was like, no, I got to see what's happening <laughs> the, you know, when the dream comes back to me. <laughs> and it was amazing how the more work I did with Bob, who was my visual imagery therapist, to really integrate my choices then and you know, do, the, do some deeper healing, that in the dream, I started having more, more agency, more choices and directing the mm -hmm. scene mm -hmm. versus when it first started, I was just like lost and I, I didn't know what was what. And I was asking all the questions versus towards the end. And again, this wasn't five steps. This was over the course of a year. It was like, no, this is what's happening. And mm. just waking up with so much more of an empowered feeling versus mm. a, I have no control in this situation. Mm, I love that. That's such an amazing story. And I, I think that is one of the great payoffs of dream work is that when you are making progress against the, the obstacles, which hinder you, you will see that in the dream. You will see what's working and then the dream and then you, but it's really important to notice what you did. You noticed those moments of progress like, ooh, I'm beginning to have agency and choice. And there's absolutely this wonderful conversation that then takes place. And this is why I've really devoted my life to dream work because of this, you know, you realize then that you're in conversation with something. And this is why dream Dream dictionaries are pretty much rubbish because they are <laughs> they are attempting to make your dream symbol into something that is static and dead. But the way that I think of dreams is like living, breathing creatures. You know, if you were to go walk into a forest and you're deep in the forest and you hear a little stirring and you look up and you see a fox in the forest and he's looking at you and you're looking at him and your eyes are locked and suddenly your whole body is filled with resonance and awe and a little bit of terror and magic. This it's, is what it's like to make an encounter with a dream if you're doing it well. It should remain autonomous and living. And you don't say, oh, that fox means I am stealthy and I like to steal things. <laughs> You know, you don't, because what, how, how's that going to help you? It doesn't help you at all. But maybe if you, 
you think, well, how can I make myself approachable to this fox? Maybe the fox will trust you and come a little closer and then you understand it a little better. And then you take a step towards him and he trusts you. And before you know it, maybe the fox puts your hand in its mouth, but it doesn't hurt. Instead, you have this telepathic connection and you understand everything. So this is an actual, you know, I'm using this this wonderful thing as an example, but I've had these this over, like you said, over years, not five steps to, you know, in trust, having your dream fox trust you, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but actually, you know, making a courtship of our dream symbols so that they reveal their hidden medicine and helping and become allies to us as they did in your case with the cancer dreams. Well, and it makes me think about when you say that it is this courtship and its nature, it makes you feel like you belong to something bigger, which is, you know, beyond that there is an organization, right? Because that's always my, like, I believe in nature as kind of my guiding framework in life. And when you can feel that there really is that courtship, I think it brings a sense of safety, or at least for me, of like, wow, I don't have to do this all on my own, you know? Yes, exactly. Exactly. I love that. I mean, you know, I say that the broader definition of dream work is not just about, you know, understanding what your dreams mean and and, uh, leaving it there. The broader definition of dream work for me is a, it's like a living bridge Mm. between between the seen and the unseen worlds. So it's a kind of a conversation between what's visible and what's behind the world that we see, the, the unseen world. So for me, that's ultimately dream work is, is um, marrying the inside life with the outer one and having them be in constant conversation. And when that happens, when you are tending to that living bridge and keeping it, keep weaving into that conversation, yes, there is a sense of uh, being supported, but also guided that, um, mm. you know, you know, you're constantly sort of regulating, like, take a step to the left and, oh, you know, that's a little bit too much left. Let's put a little more right on that, like walking on a tightrope, you know, finding that place of balance and eventually, you know, if you're one of those people who has a lot of really difficult, painful, scary dreams, I just want to reassure you that there, that if you actually turn towards them and become curious about them and maybe even begin to tend to their value in your life, that those dreams will change. So long as you are acknowledging those little changes, they can add up into a complete remission of scary dreams. Oh, I love, and getting us to author our story, right? And find ourselves way back to where we belong in the process, right? (laughs) Exactly. It's all part of the same thing. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And another thing that you wrote that stopped me in my tracks was you said, dis- and you know, I think again, when we think of consistency, we think we need discipline, but you define discipline so that we can belong. You say discipline is to relinquish the immature desire to be taken care of in false belonging and to parent our own originality. And I just love that. And I was wondering, how can we start to know that we're kind of on track with our belonging? What do we start to feel? as we start to listen to our dreams and as we start to re-welcome anger and these other sides of ourselves that we've exiled, how do we know that we're on track? (laughs) Mm, That's such a great question. I think at first it feels a little bit like waking up from a deep slumber, you know, and you know, if you if your arm has ever fallen or your leg has fallen asleep, you get these like terrible pins and needles as the, the, the limb comes back to life. There's something like that, you know, where there can initially be some very challenging things that come up for us as we 
are practicing at belonging, I look at it sort of like a mythic unfolding. You know, we start in these places because we are so split off from who we really are and what we love and what our values are. We start in places of false belonging, actually, whether that's false belonging in a relationship or a workplace or a spiritual group or even probably a dietary path or whatever it is. Places that require us to split parts of ourselves off in order to maintain life in that place of false belonging. But as we enter into exile and isolation, we have these very long, difficult periods where maybe we got really sick. Or maybe we got fired from a job, or maybe we had heartbreak or loss of some kind. And suddenly we're isolated and we're no longer in a place of false belonging, but we're, or, you know, we're no longer in a place we used to think was home, like wellness, for instance. And that period can last a very long time where you're actually in this state of exile. And so when I'm talking about pins and needles, that's what I'm talking about is like the real Mm. descent into like, not ever knowing where the light at the end of the tunnel is going to be and how are you going to survive this and where did all my friends go and you know how am I ever going to figure out what to do with my life and will I ever find love again and these kinds of questions are all about belonging they are where they are ultimately where do I belong and am I even worthy of belonging and so these are the pins and needles questions which will come up and confront you. And this is when I think it's really important to turn to the inner life to actually look at what's going on in your dreams so that you can begin to map out the dimensionality of your exile. And the paradoxical thing is that by really acknowledging and understanding the landscape of being outcast, you are actually turning towards a place of belonging, turning towards home, if you stay with this. So then I think, you know, when you're beginning to make what in the mythic tales is called the return, which is like the return to life or the return to your own body or the return to spirituality or whatever your particular thing is. This is another really long and very gradual process in my experience anyway, where you sort of feel like you're making little triumphs. And whether that means, oh, you know, when I did this physio exercise, it was my whole leg was shaking when I did it the first time. But on the third time, my leg didn't shake. That is like a huge triumph, you know. And it's those moments which we have to treat with kindness and and celebration and respect instead of going into that. It's not enough. I have to get all the way there because that is, that's the, I call it one of the pillars of patriarchy, perfectionism. It will kill everything that you've brought alive. And so you really have to go on a perfectionism diet, I think, um, when you're doing this work and really recognize these small, insignificant, and triumph. And then I think what happens is you'll start to see new supportive images and scenarios and characters in your dreams. You'll start to feel little sparkles of joy and the ability to recognize beauty. You'll start to experience synchronicities in your life. And simple things like, oh, I was just thinking of that. And I listened to this podcast and she said this thing, which I was just thinking about. It may seem insignificant only if you brush it aside. But if you aggrandize it, if you if you welcome it, if you celebrate it, then those things will continue to grow. And then the moments of joy turn into hours of joy. And the hours of well-being turn into days of belonging. And soon before you know it, the architecture of belonging has been spun out of the center of the self into a life of meaning. 
And not only that, and this is the great kicker, is that that place becomes a shelter of belonging for others, actually. And you realize that belonging was actually yours to give away. Because you feel like you have enough, so you can, right? (laughs) That's right. Yeah, a natural generosity springs out of our hearts. That was so beautiful. And I really want we're I really want my Truths with Food group to take that to heart. They're in that stage where they're starting to get those beginning wins, you know, and I'm like, keep going and, and, and trying to tell them it's not about perfectionism. Like these are these new choices that have come from really hard work. I want everyone, of course, to take that in, but special, special recognition for our Truths with Food group. <laughs> it was right in that process right now, emerging from it. Pa, thank you so much for being here. We will have everywhere people can contact you and find you, but please share it here. Um, but again, everyone in the show notes will have, you've got to buy her book, Belonging. I read it twice and I don't usually read books twice. <laughs> kind of like, I got the big picture, but I went back and, and read it twice. It was so good. And so we'll also have where you can find her um, in the show notes. But for right now, Pa, where can people find you? Thank you, Allie. That's amazing that you read it twice. There's also an audiobook version on um, Audible if people prefer to do that. And I know some people who have disabilities have a hard time reading, like holding a book. And so that could be helpful too. So to find me, you know, everything is on my website, tokopa.com. So my name is spelled T-O-K-O dash P-A dot com. And if you want to find out about the book directly, I have another website, which is belongingbook.com, belongingbook.com. So I have a great Instagram page, which I've only been doing for a year because I'm such a late bloomer when it comes to Instagram, but I love it. It's such a cool platform. So my handle over there is Tokopad. It's just T-O-K-O-P-A without the hyphen. And then I'm also on Facebook and I've been, I have an established page on Facebook because I've been there for, I think, eight or nine years. So tons of free little inspirations and beautiful art every single day in those places if people just need a little hit to stay on track and lots of excerpts from the book as well. Yeah, I'm totally plug her uh, your Instagram page because I follow it and it's just such a you were, you leave excerpts from the book, you have these beautiful visual images and I'm like this is what social media can be about. <laughs> right? Mm. Connecting you with with that knowing. So I highly recommend following her on Instagram. I'm not on Facebook a lot. I'm sure that page is great too, but definitely do Instagram <laughs> if you're <laughs> on. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Tokopa, and all of your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, Ali. Thank you so much for the conversation and for sharing my work with your wonderful listeners. I look forward to crossing paths again in the future in some unknown way. Yeah, when the mystery thinks it's time. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? Find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real, and liberating. Mm